escalating slightly for one of them, but hopefully it'll be here soon. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to our authors to give themselves a little introduction to the scene. Should we start with you? Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in. It's a whole new way of doing events, uh, but uh, you know we all have to adapt. So my name is Vasim Khan. I write two crime series. Uh, the first is the Baby Ganesh Agency series, a set of crime novels set in modern India in Mumbai, featuring a, a lead detective called Inspector Ashwin Chopra, a very rigid, honest man from the Mumbai police force, who's forced into early retirement in his late forties, and then he goes on to solve various murders and kidnapping over the course of the series. And uh, in the first book, The Unexpected Inheritance of Inspector Chopra, which came out uh, about five years ago, he also inherits a one-year-old baby elephant, which becomes his, uh, not his partner, because the elephant doesn't fly or sing or talk or do anything like that. It becomes a symbol of India and his, his sort of sidekick that gets into the action occasionally. Uh, but I'm now moved on to uh, writing a historical crime series uh, called the Malabar House Crime Series. And that is set in 1950 in India and introduces India's first female police detective, uh, Persis Wadia. And the first book in that series is out in August, and that's called uh, Midnight at Malabar House. Sounds amazing. Maggie? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maggie James. I'm a full-time novelist and write psychological suspense novels. Um, I don't write in series. I know a lot of people love series, but I've never been attracted to that idea. I prefer to write standalone, so... At the moment, I've got seven novels published, one novella and one non-fiction book. Um, I'm what's known as a hybrid author in that some of my titles are traditionally published with Light Union and the others I've independently published with my own publishing house. And I imagine that's going to continue into the future. Um, I love what I do. I always wanted to be a novelist ever since I was a little girl. So it makes me very, very happy that I've managed to achieve my ambition. So um, that's a little bit about me. Wonderful. I'll give you a question um, just to get started. And one of them came in for you, this theme from Mike Craven. He says, will there be any unusual sidekicks in your new series? <laughs> so a quick plug for Mike. Uh, if you haven't read his uh, his wonderful books, um, which are set uh, set up in Cumbria, you really should, uh, really should take a, a look. I think his new one is called The Curator. And I've certainly enjoyed all of, uh, all mm. of the books uh, so yeah. far. Um, so a quick plug for Mike. He's a good friend as well, and we always have a lot of a uh, lot of fun. The last time I was up in Cumbria, he took me to his his local pub pub where he rules, uh, with his um, rock and roll jacket on. He's got his wonderful rock and roll leather jacket. Um, to answer Mike's question, uh, no, there are no unusual protagonists in uh, in this particular series, other than the fact that Persis lives above um, uh, Bombay's oldest bookshop which her father runs. It's called the Wadia Book Emporium. So he's a bit of an unusual character. He, uh, he lost his, uh, the use of his legs during uh, uh, the Raj era, protesting against the British uh, during the Quit India movement. And he's quite a, a curm curmudgeonly type book uh, seller. And, you know, she has a few interactions with him, which are quite fun. Right, and then I've got a question for both of you. It says, uh, will any of you feature the current lockdown situation in any of your future novels? No, absolutely not. It's bad enough living through it. I don't want to write about it. And I honestly don't believe that people want to read about it. I mean, definitely on Facebook and some of the readers groups, so people have been putting up polls about this particular question. Both authors and readers, most of them have said they're going to leave it well alone. And I, I intend to follow that. <laughs> um I don't know. I might take the contrary opinion there. Certainly, I couldn't feature it in my in my in my current series because it's set in 1950 and there were no lockdowns. Um, but I think uh, you know where if you look at the number of people currently streaming movies like uh, Contagion and all sorts of zombie apocalyptic uh, um, uh, movies, and also the the sales of uh, apocalyptic fiction has gone through the roof at the moment. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a whole raft of books that came out along those lines. I think Peter May dug one out of his, um, mm, yeah. his, his drawer call, and called, called it Lockdown and, and, and has got it published straight away within like a, a month or something. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if a lot of people not only published it, but a lot of people bought into it. And because once we've had time to reflect after this, you know how when time passes, things never seem as bad as they were when you were experiencing them. 
I mean, you should look at the World War. You would have thought that that was a terrible period and nobody wanted to revisit it. But, you know, a thousand movies and a thousand books about the war later, how can anyone say that they won't be writing about it or won't be interested in, in reading about it? Yeah, I think you make a good point there for seeing, you know, certainly. But, um, yeah, so we shall see. <laughs> Has it affected your writing at all, either of you? Have you found yourselves more or less productive? I think it's made me a little less productive. I mean, I work full time from home anyway, so my personal circumstances haven't changed a great deal. But certainly in the early days of the lockdown, I think it was unsettling for everyone. Um, yeah, I think it did make me a bit more anxious and less productive. And I feel much more settled now that, you know, we're several weeks into the lockdown and I'm back to my usual routine. But yes, in a way it did. Yeah. Um, I think the first two weeks were quite difficult because I, I work at a university at UCL in a crime science department and for us it was all about trying to transfer all of our teaching and research online and trying to connect with the various communities that we work with and that took a bit of time. Uh, my, my job is quite flexible uh, because I do a lot of writing now. Um, but after that, once you got past the whole we're in this new situation, I think... I think I think it has think been it has quite been productive, productive because I've stayed in two and a half hours traveling every day to, to, London, London, to, to central London and back. So, um, yeah, I, I think I've been quite productive. I mean, I've written about, what, I, I try to write in the evenings or on weekends, so it's not been as good as I could have because I've been so busy in the day. Uh, but I think I've got through about 20 odd thousand words. I'm quite behind still, but I'm hoping to slowly catch up. Great. Um, and then another question that we've got here, before um, we went live is did you all deliberately set out to have unusual protagonists or did it happen that way? Um, I certainly didn't. I mean, in a way, I feel almost a little bit of a fraud being on this panel because as I think I said to you, Kaz, I'm not sure any of my protagonists are particularly unusual, but I love dunking them into unusual situations. And that's particularly so with my latest one, what I did with my poor character in Silent Winter. But no, I never set out to, to do that. I like to have a challenge with every book I write, but so far it hasn't included an unusual protagonist, but I think that's definitely on the cards for the future, though I'm not sure it's going to be a baby elephant, not like Basim. <laughs> I don't think I can top that one. I think they're, they're unusual in that they're not police or detectives or things like that. Your protagonists tend to just be normal. Yeah, I, I could not write a police series. I, I'm even... I fight shy of writing scenes in my books that involve the police because I just don't feel I have enough knowledge and I don't particularly want to go and get the knowledge of police procedure because A, it's changing all the time and B, mm. it just doesn't attract me. The same with I don't like writing scenes in hospitals because I don't know anything about medicine and things like that. So I do tailor my characters to what suits me and I, I suspect every author does that. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a good thing, Maggie, because... There are a lot of police procedurals out there, and um, you know, you're, you're, when you write one, you are conscious of the fact that you're going into this massively crowded environment. And occasionally, because I read a lot of crime fiction, uh, in a, in a, like most crime authors, and it's quite nice now and again to come across a book that has a different type of protagonist, or a different setting, or a different story. I recently uh, read a book called What's Left of Me is your, Yours by an author called Stephanie Scott and it was set in Tokyo and uh, it was about an industry where apparently you can pay for someone to come and seduce your missus or your husband <laughs> to, so that you can win a divorce case against them and <laughs> I'd never even heard of this I'd never even heard of this industry so that was quite an unusual set of protagonists and, a, and an unusual setting yeah, for my own, that's but, fascinating idea. yeah and it's a really good book actually it's really well yeah. written so um you know I, I i found it enjoyable um i from my from my own point of view i i lived in india for a decade i was grew up in in london i went to india age 23 i spent a wonderful decade there and when i got back to the uk i wanted to put all of those memories into a into a novel about modern bombay modern mumbai uh, and i think that when i was doing it i was conscious of the fact that i had after seven attempts since the age of 17 not been published uh, having sent stuff into agents and I had almost given up the ghost so I, I got not really fed up but to the point where I thought oh forget it. it's not going to get published anyway you might as well do what you like 
and the kind and put in everything about India that you enjoy. Oh. And that's how we ended up with um, this sidekick character of of an elephant for Inspector Chopra. Uh, because when I was in India, I, I, I actually saw elephants on the streets, which is not something that you see in the UK. I, I, fell, in love with, I fell in love with this whole idea that, uh, you know, you could have elephants out in the open doing things. Um, and I just I just added it. I'd never expected it to be published or to have a four book offer from Hodder and for it to become a, you know, a series, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Well, thank, um, how much influence do you have on your book covers, both of you? Because both of them are, I've read both of your books and they're both really attractive covers. Well, certainly with my, um, the, the titles I've got with Late Union, I had very little input and that seems to be the norm with publishers. Um, I wasn't particularly happy with the cover of After She's Gone, but I was given no say in it whatsoever and they actually changed the title as well. Um, very happy with the cover of His Kidnapper's Shoes. Um, but yes, it is something I have, have no say in or very little say. Whereas obviously it's totally different with my independently published titles. I've got full full um, input into my designer on that. And it's, it d definitely makes for a more pleasant experience for the author because you know you end up with a cover you're really happy with. But um, yes, yeah, mixed bag with covers when it comes to uh, publishing. I think just to, just to um, possibly disillusion a few budding authors, as an author, certainly as one starting out, you have ex very, very little say over a lot of things. Um, and your cover is one of them. Yes, they ask you for your input, but ultimately, uh, you know, a big publisher like Hodder has their own in-house in designers who come up with final designs and things. I mean, I've been quite lucky. So I've so this is the cover of my latest book, for instance, Bad Day at the Vulture Club. And all of my books have followed a similar kind of colourful format um, and... I've actually liked them a lot. They asked me what I'd like. I'd said, well, my books have a grain of humor and they're set in India. So there's lots of color and, and all of that. But there is a grittier element to, to, to most of them. So try and capture that in the cover. And I've been incredibly pleased with, with what they've done. So that's been good. The same goes for audio books. I'm sure you've found this as well, Maggie, where you get very little choice. You get maybe a clip or a snippet of one or two voices that They've, they've picked who, who might be useful, who might be suitable for, for the audio book. And, uh, you know, you get asked as a courtesy, but mm. if you were to say, no, I'd rather have, you know, Laurence Olivier do this, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I didn't even get sound clips from my audio books. I just got questionnaires saying, you know, do you, what sort of accents do you need or want? And, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. But, yeah, I didn't even get sound clips. So, um Funnily enough, I wasn't that bothered about that so much as the actual cover. But anyway, yeah, I agree with you. You know, traditionally published authors get very, very little say over, you know, what happens with their books. Yeah. On the plus side. I, mean, I hope I'm not being negative because there is a, there is a good... Oh, here's Will. Oh, here's hi, Will. Will. There he is. Hi, Will. He's in hey, his little uh, Hello. Cabin. I'm so sorry I'm late. <laughs> no, no, better late than never, Will. Yeah, Fashionably late. Thank you. I tell you what, we should stop talking for a bit because we've been we've been hogging the the mic. So yeah, over to you. Why Will. don't you over to you to introduce yourself? You going to say anything, Will? I we don't think you know. we lost Fine. him again. Can you hear me? We can no, hear you. you. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's gone again. Oh, he's gone again. Well, short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in between, I'm going to ask you some of the questions that are coming in on the stream. Um, that one of them says, "Do you have a favourite book that you have written?" Ooh. published or unpublished? I think it's open. It doesn't specify. For me, I think that would be a toss-up between my last two, Silent Winter and Deception Wears Many Faces. Um, they were just incredible fun to write, particularly Silent Winter, because it's probably my darkest book, and I really tortured my poor old protagonist, and that's great fun, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's hard. I mean, I love them all because they're my babies, but um, and also my firstborn, His Kidnapper's Shoes, because that was my first ever novel. That will always have a special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm quite fond of this latest paperback that's come out in the Chopra series. It's the fifth one in the series. 
Uh, and the reason that I'm fond of it is because it explores, like all of my books explore a certain aspect of, of India, which I think that we don't know a lot about in the West. So I use that as a backdrop while Chopra is busy solving his murders and whatnot. And in this one, it's, uh, it's about the Parsi community, who I really didn't know much about. And they are a very small but very wealthy and influential community based mainly in Bombay. And the thing about them is that Hindus and Muslims either cremate or bury their dead, but the Parsis leave their dead out in these towers of stone towers in the middle of Mumbai for vultures to eat. It's a process called excarnation. And I found that really fascinating. So I stage a murder in that community and then we get Chopra to solve it. So I'm quite fond of the way that that book uh, explores that particular rather interesting uh, community. Right, Will's back. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so sorry. I, I, my forest broadband, I think, is to blame. I'm really, I do apologize. 15 minutes late. Go on, hold the mic for me. Sorry? Do you want to introduce yourself, Will? I will. I, and again, I'm sorry to all the viewers. Uh, my name is Will Dean. I write the Tuva Moody Son uh, crime series set in deepest, darkest rural Sweden. And I mean, that's the problem for that's the reason for this technological hitch, because um, <laughs> I also live in deepest, darkest Sweden in the middle of nowhere off grid. Um, but yeah, I write to the Moody Son, who is a young deaf journalist uh, who writes for a small newspaper in the town of Gavrik, which is kind of like a Twin Peaks or Fargo kind of town. Um, and Tuva, yeah, Tuva's young, she's deaf, and she's extremely tenacious and complicated. And uh, the first book in the series was Dark Pines, the second Red Snow, and the new one is called Black River. Awesome. We had a question come in before um, we even went live, which said, why did you choose to make your lead character deaf? That's a good question. So Tuva... I'm a very visual writer, so I kind of see a scenario or see a world quite vividly before I'm ready to try and write it. And with Tuva, I started out with the setting, which was this huge, overgrown, sprawling, dark pine forest in Sweden. And in my mind's eye, I zoomed in and I saw a, a gravel dirt track snaking through the pine trees. And I zoomed in closer and I saw a pickup truck and I looked through the window and I saw this young blonde woman and she had hearing aids. So she came to me like that, like a thunderbolt. She was pretty fully formed. And then when I started writing her and I started writing those first few pages in her voice, she, her voice just flooded out very naturally, like an exorcism. And I just kind of, like the readers do, I started to try and figure out this character. And I'm still trying to figure her out now. I'm just about to write to the number five this month. And I still haven't really worked her out. Well, we've got a message in from Leslie Thompson for you, Will, that says she's a total fan of Tuva. Hello. I'm a total fan of Leslie, uh, but that's very <laughs> nice. I do enjoy writing Tuva. She's a lot cooler than I am, and she's got better opinions. I think she probably wouldn't want to have a coffee with me. You know, she would <laughs> like to have with the readers, but I don't think she would have any interest in, in talking to me. And she's kind of the opposite of me in a lot of ways. She's a city person. So she, I put her in this small redneck town in Sweden, but she, she really wants to be living in Sweden, uh, sorry, in Stockholm or in London or Madrid or in Tokyo. So she, there's a constant conflict there because she doesn't like where she lives. Cool. I've got a question for all of you now. What are your most memorable moments as authors? I think for me, it was definitely when I finished the first draft of his Kidnapper's Shoes. I mean, it was an incredibly emotional and overwhelming moment for me. I still get choked up when I just think about it, because for decades and decades, I'd wanted to write a novel. And then I suddenly got a bit between my teeth. And in, within two months, I'd finished the first draft. And it was a long, rambling mess. But I'd actually done it. And I was just so happy and so proud. And I'm not sure anything in my writing career can top that moment. So, yeah, that will be it for me. Well, uh, you go first, Vaz. I've got to think about it. All right. It. So <laughs> in no particular order of importance, getting published after 23 years uh, and 200 rejection letters. I think that was quite important. Going on to BBC Breakfast Sofa to launch the first book in the series, The Unexpected Inheritance of Inspector Chopra. That was quite fun. 
playing my first match for the Authors Eleven, for which is a cricket team which uh, has a hundred and fifty odd year old tradition. I think Arthur Conan Doyle started it off, or, or was one of the earliest players. So that was quite, quite good. Um, and I think now it's just uh, last year. I think speaking at Harrogate, which is quite a which is a thing that most crime authors, because it's the biggest crime festival in the world, to be invited to speak on the Harrogate stage is quite uh, is, is something that you you think about, but you never think it's going to happen. And then when you do get invited, you know you do feel as if you uh, you've reached certainly somewhere. I've got a similar kind of similar range of answers. Really, the first thing was getting picked up in a slush pile after all of those rejections and all of those years trying to find an agent and suddenly that first letter from an agent saying I want to read more of this is just an amazing feeling because for so many months and years you think am I doing am I doing this thing and it's never going to happen yeah. so finally for finally somebody to to vindicate you and say this is I want to read some more of your work is a huge deal and then with Dark Pines, uh, it was part of the Zoe Ball Book Club, so I got to you know be on TV and meet her and all of that, which was exciting. And then at the same time, Val McDermott picked it for her new blood panel at Harrogate, like like Baz mm -hmm. was saying. But that's a huge yeah. deal. But Harrogate's such a wonderful festival. And I think all of my festival visits around the world have been really memorable. I was in Hong Kong last year for the book fair, which was amazing. I'd never been there before. But overall, I think the thing that really gets to me is whenever a deaf reader reaches out to Twitter on an email or something and says, thank you for writing Tuva, or Tuva is, reads authentic to me, that, that is like a, quite an emotional feeling for me. Mm -hmm. and, and if I might just plug it, I mean, I, I read the first one when it came out. And, you know, not only do you capture that dark creepiness of the Swedish forest, which I hadn't realised because I always thought the Swedes were very... Uh, very enlightened, bright kind of types. And I hadn't realized there was this whole sort of serial killer vibe going on in the forest. Um, <laughs> but also I think the, that you captured that deaf protagonist without going heavy handed. And I think that was uh, that was terrific. Well, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. It really does. Um, my wife would rather that I did not write about the dark, murderous forest. <laughs> <laughs> as we live in the middle. He wants me to write something much light heart, more, more light-hearted, some kind of Bill Bryson type book. Um, but... uh, I've got another question for all of you as well that says, how's your research brought up unexpected things? I think any author in the sort of genre we're in, we have to research some fairly unusual things. And I... I certainly wouldn't like anyone from the police force to look through my browsing history because I've researched things like you know, <laughs> yeah. decomposition rates of bodies in cold water. I had to do that for Blackwater Lake. Um, yeah, some of what we have to research is fairly grim, you know, sort of the book I'm writing at the moment, I've had to research, um, you know, some fairly unpleasant stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think it's in the nature of a game that that's inevitably going to happen. It's actually great fun, you know, it's, uh, you know, because we're all we're doing it on the safe side of things. You know, I don't have to know about, you know, obviously I need to know about dead bodies in water. But, you know, it's all sort of third hand, you know, it's all at the end of Dr. Google. So, uh, yeah, all nice and sanitized. Vasim, did you have to do any research uh, when it comes to baby elephants? <laughs> well, I was lucky because I there was a there was an old retired circus elephant living next to me in Bombay where I when I when I lived there in Mumbai, um, and I used to go and visit it. I mean, it was a bit broken down, and it, it used to go around with a beggar fellow, uh, but I could actually see the elephant in in the wild. It wasn't a baby elephant; it was a hulking, great big thing. Uh, but you know, you can do quite a lot of research. I'm actually finding it a lot more fun doing historical research because um, my latest series uh, is set in 1950 in India, as I was saying earlier, Caroline, and so I'm on to the second book. The first one comes out in August. The second one, which I'm writing now, I discovered that in, in Bombay, uh, at what is known as the Asiatic Society of Bombay, they have got a 700-year-old copy of Dante's um, The Divine Comedy. It's supposedly the second oldest copy in the world. And in the 1930s, uh, Mussolini offered a million pounds to, to the Indian government to buy it back, but they, they refused. Now, God knows what a million pounds is worth in today's money. Um, and I, I thought that was incredibly fascinating. So I've made, I've made it the centerpiece of the second novel in, the, in, in that series. 
So, yeah, historical research, I think, really does throw up a lot of these kind of facts that we just just don't know. Okay, yeah, I'm I, I'm a bit of a fraud on this because I don't really do much research, to be honest. Um, maybe it's because I don't write kind of police procedurals. Um, I leave that to people who do it a much better job than I ever could. Um, I, I just write weird books. I'm kind of surprised they ever got published, to be honest. <laughs> Because they're so eccentric and strange, and uh, I, I really rely on my imagination more than research. Uh, Ninety percent of it is me daydreaming and coming up with uh, coming up with characters, and those characters are where everything stems from. If I come up with five or six different characters and I understand what motivates them in life and how they're connected, that's where the story starts to ring true for me. Um, but I do end up researching. I've done a lot of research into deafness, of course, which is not like a criminal thing, but it's obviously, but it's uh, it's something that I wasn't aware of all the nuances before. And I'm still researching that for every single book so that I can do two for justice. But then I also like for the Dark Pines, I was researching the hunting culture in Sweden, in rural Sweden, what kind of rifles they use, what's the etiquette around elk hunting towers and things like that. So it's not necessarily anything that most crime writers would research. It's all kind of quite <laughs> esoteric, weird, rural Swedish stuff, most of it. Well, there's a question that's come in for you, Will, but I'm sort of interested in everybody's answer to it. That's, is yours, your books, are they based in a real town? So is, it's, is Gavrik a real town, but do you also, the other authors, do you invent places or do you use real are they completely real, your places that you base your books in? Yeah, all my books are based in Bristol, which is my birth city, although the latest one is, I now live near Newcastle upon Tyne, so there's a nod to Newcastle in my latest book. I've only ever made up one location, that was for Blackwater Lake, and that was simply because there wasn't a country park of a sort that I wanted with the right geographical features close to Bristol, so I just invented it. But other than that, yeah, they're all set in Bristol, and that will continue to be the case, even though I've moved out of the city. I kind of like the continuity of having them all set in one city. Did you enjoy writing that fictional place and doing yeah, that? I did, actually, because I could see it so clearly in my head, and... Um, Yes, it just made, I mean, writing that novella was fun anyway. Um, that was the one I had to do the research about decomposition rates of bodies <laughs> in cold water, you know, which I enjoyed anyway. So, uh, yes, I did. It was fun creating a fictional place. And I definitely think I will be open to doing that again in the future. Uh, well, my, my books are set in Mumbai, formerly Bombay. Um, so, you know, it's all real. One question I continually get is, you know, why is Mumbai, why is Bombay now called Mumbai? And a lot of people think there's a relationship between the names, but there's no relationship whatsoever. Uh, about 30 odd years ago, the Indian government decided to rename all of the things that the British had, had named. And Bombay was originally named by the Portuguese who'd come there in the 1500s when Bombay was still a series of islands. And they called it uh, Bombahia, which in Portuguese means good bay. And that's where Bombay came from. But Mumbai comes from the goddess of the original fisher people who used to populate those islands in that were Bombay and their goddess is called Mumba Devi and that's why it was that's why it was renamed Mumbai so just, just throwing that out there that is I never knew that thank you for sharing that <laughs> <laughs> my my town that I, I have invented Gavrik yeah it's completely fictional it's a little bit based on, uh, I lived in the East Midlands as a kid uh, up until 18 and I moved around a lot from village to little village. So I'm, ob I'm obsessed with setting and with sense of place. And as a writer now, I get to play God a little bit and create this world and I want, I can put, you know, a pub here and I can put a factory here and I, I enjoy that. I'm like a big kid playing with one of those road map rugs. That's how I feel when I'm, when I'm creating this place. And, um, so yeah, Gavrik's completely fictional. It's a little bit based on my local town, which is like a half an hour drive out of the forest, which is also kind of got one McDonald's and one little post office, and it's very small, and everybody knows each other. Um, so I, I, Gavrik is fictional. It's based on a lot of real places and, and just stuff in my imagination, but it's the main thing is it's very simple. So a reader, I think, can get the hang of it, of the layout and the streets pretty quickly. And then book after book, hopefully that builds upon 
layer after layer so you get a real sense of the place that maybe it's kind of real um but all the places around it all the towns and rivers and top topographical features around it are real so i just literally with dark pines i found a map of sweden of vermland in central sweden and i tried to find a bit that was completely unpopulated just like bogland and that's where i put my town so i know where so you can't get anybody coming in and saying well sorry that post office is at number 22 and not at number 21 <laughs> exactly then yeah and, th and there are people who do that i got so my first book has been translated into 15 languages and you know i get weird weird mail from from odd corners of the world just picking up on a tiny detail that i you would think nobody cares about Literally <laughs> nobody on earth would care about it i mean you're laughing maggie maybe you've had the same <laughs> same experience um, I've had uh, comments about the level of swearing in my books. Um, okay. Yeah, which is unusual because I, I just don't swear in real life and I have to be really, really angry and that doesn't really happen. But I mean, I think it's a little unfair to criticise authors for having their characters swe uh, swear in the books because, I mean, you have to portray real life and if you've got an antagonist who's a pretty nasty character, he's probably going to use swear words and curse, you know, um, I think you can't, as an author, bow to every whim and predilection of what certain readers might might or not want. It's the same with how much, you know, sort of sexual activity you put in your books. That's always going to offend some people. But again, I say, if it's relevant to the character and the plot, then it has to go in. That's my particular take on it anyway. It's a fine line, isn't it? As an author, you're you're treading a fine line because as you write more books and you get into the industry a bit, you're writing for yourself, of course you are, always, but you're also writing with one eye on your readers, different types of readers. You're also writing with one eye on what the critics are going to say, because, you know, we all want to have good reviews and, and be featured in newspapers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're writing in with one eye on the bloggers, because the bloggers are increasingly important to helping, and we appreciate all of their efforts. You're writing with one eye on what the booksellers will do, because they have to stop mm. these books, and there's only sh so much shelf space. So it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act, it's a balancing act. Mm. I mean, you can't please everyone. There is no book that, no. you know, is going to please every single person on the planet. You will always get people who will take umbrage at some aspect of it. So Look at the Booker Prize winners. Yeah. yeah. They always divide everyone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, you've just got to write from your heart and do the best, put out the best story you can into the world and, you know, accept the fact that you're going to probably annoy and, you know, some people with it and that's life Why is it's both? true it's a good thing if you get a bunch of five star reviews and a bunch of one star reviews i'm quite happy with that i don't want three star reviews saying it's fine i'd rather <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that's a good point because you know some people you know they will see a one star review and if they're a bit of a contrarian character they will pick the book up on the basis of it having a one-star review because they want to see what someone dislikes so much about it. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. When I was younger... Yeah. Sorry. Karen? No, it was carry on. Sorry. I was just going to say, for, for people who are listening in who are budding authors or trying to get published, um, you know, during the 23 years where I was trying to get published and couldn't, and I, you know, I got quite disheartened, Every few years, I'd finish a novel, send it off, get the rejection letters, and it took a while to pick yourself up the floor, off the floor and start again. Uh, but I came across this quote from an author who I really admired. He's a literary author called John Irving, and he wrote The Cider House Rules and The World According to Garp, and, you know, all made into famous movies now. And he, when he was younger, uh, he went through the same process of not getting very far and thinking of packing it in. And then he met an author he admired and the author said to him, John, you have to stop saying to yourself that you're going to become an author one day. If you're writing, you are an author. And if you believe that, then whether you get published or not is irrelevant, because if you're doing it every day, you're going to get better. And once you get to a certain standard that is publishable, then all it requires is a little bit of luck, you know, hitting the right a uh, novel, at the, on, getting it on the right agent's desk at the right time, because we, we none of us like to talk about it. But there is quite a bit of fortune once you get to a, to, to a standard where your work is publishable. And that's where a lot of people don't don't get it, that it's like anything else. You don't become a, a, a top tennis player overnight. Um, you know, you, you spend years, decades, if not, practicing to the level to get to the level where your skills are good enough. And I think a lot of people don't have enough distance from their work when they're starting out 
to be able to judge that this is of a publishable standard. And that's why 99% of stuff that gets to agents gets dumped straight in the bin after two pages, because the, not because the idea is bad, because, because the quality of writing is not publishable. Mm. That's a good point. That's a really good point, Baz. I, I remember seeing uh, an interview with an old screenwriter who was in his 70s, and he said he had lunch with a group of friends, three or four other screenwriters in Hollywood, and they were all guys in their 70s and 80s. And they were trying to figure out what was the one thing that kind of they had in common. Why did they? Why were they successful for so many years? And the one thing they could figure out was, I mean, they were all white guys. I've got to say, you know, in Hollywood, so maybe that was helpful. But the one thing they had in common was the fact that they said they didn't quit. They weren't more talented than the other people who dropped out forty years ago. They probably weren't as good writers as those, but they just kept going. They would every time they get knocked down, they got up again, Absolutely. and they they kept trying to get better. Hmm. I've got a question from Angela Wren here for you. She says she's curious to know what process you go through to create your characters. Okay. Um, Maggie? Um, I'm quite a bit of a plotter by nature rather than, you know, what's called a pantser who just sort of, you know, sets out with a blank sheet. So I do like to plot in advance and part of that is creating characters. So I usually have a little bio for each character, you know, the sort of the basic details like their name, their age, um, marital status, but also, you know, their interests, their opinions, what makes them different and everything. And it gradually comes to me, it's like layer upon layer. So I usually start a book with a basic premise of the character, but I find a lot of fleshing out a character for me happens as I write the first draft because that's when I really get to know them. When I'm doing my character plotting before I start to write, it's as if I'm reading someone's biography and it's all a bit of a distance. But when I start to write the book, it's as if I'm actually sitting down with the characters and getting to know them, and that's when they really start to come to life for me and I, I flesh out more details about them. I just get to know them better, really. So it's kind of a two-step process for me. I, I have imaginary conversations with my lead characters because I find that's quite helpful. You know, I say that tongue in cheek, but if you try to imagine your character, so my, my current character it's the first time I've written a female lead, uh, Persis Wadia. She's India's first female police inspector. So to get inside and create that character properly, you do your research, but you also need to get inside the mind of what she would be feeling as the lone police, a female police officer in a very misogynistic, paternalistic 1950s Indian society. You know, what, how would she react to that? And if you have a conversation with her, as, as, I, as I try to do, uh, you get to understand some of her opinions and not everything I say she likes. Um, but but that, that gives me feedback so I can sort of hone that character a bit. I'm kind of like this, a mixture of all of these approaches as well. I, I don't do the, the CV thing of writing down the, the, what the character looks like and where they went to school. Uh, I think I did do that because at, at some point back in the day, but it just doesn't work for me. So I kind of just find, I figure out roughly what the character is. And then, as has been said, you know, I just start writing them and see what happens. But what I'm really interested in is the relationships between characters, how they react to each other, how they, what motivates them in life, what they, re, what they actually love in life and what actually is holding them back and that they're not happy about. That's what I'm obsessed with. Often I don't really know what they look like and I'm not that interested in what they look like. It's more... Where are they in life? You know, what are they? What do they need right now? That's what obsesses me about the characters. And with Tuva, it's not really a conscious thing at all, ever. It's I don't really think about Tuva. I just kind of, I feel like when I'm writing a first draft with her, I'm kind of look seeing the world through her eyes. So it's more of an instinctive thing. I just kind of feel my way through it, and and she has certain reactions to certain situations and certain people that I wouldn't have. But that's just that's just the way Tuva is. Yeah, I think all authors work differently. I mean, I take your point, Will. I actually love exploring my character's emotions. I love putting them in nasty situations, really sort of torturing them psychologically and then exploring the emotions they feel. Um, to me, that's, that's great. And that's really how I get to know my characters is by throwing them in the deep end and seeing what they do. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 
I've run quite a few workshops around uh, crime writing. And the one thing I always say is I try and capture it with three letters, O, C and B, which is obstacles, challenges and barriers. If your character goes through your entire novel without obstacles or challenges or barriers to what they're trying to achieve, then it's going to be quite a dull character. You might still have a plot there, but the character needs to be challenged throughout the novel, not just um, through the plot of a crime novel, but in their personal lives so that you you come up with some rich um, scenes and things for them to do that are outside of the main main plot. Uh, a lot of people hate writing the filler bit. You, you know what I mean, guys, when I say the filler bit? Because there's very rare crime novel that just goes from A to Z through the plot. I mean, if you take Rebus, which is a brilliant example, you know, we have the Rebus novels, uh, Rebus going off and then you see, you see his explorations of the messes he gets into with his personal life uh, and that all adds to the richness of the character I think so you need that yeah I think they have to be flawed as well what I don't like is if I pick up a book and the characters are perfect and back in the days when I used to write read standard romances that's what really annoyed me you had this perfect flawless heroine heroine you know the sort of the man was actually you know stepped out the you know modeling catalog and they were just too perfect and to me that's really dull i love having flawed characters because we can relate to that far better i think you know and also if they're flawed it means if you throw them into a deep end into difficult situations their reactions are going to be much more interesting i totally agree so many readers are drawn to the protagonists of Ian Rankin, like Vaz said, and Val McDermott and Anne Cleves, because they are flawed and they feel so real that I'm quite happy to read 20 or 30 books in a series with that same character because they feel like a neighbour or a friend of a friend or something. Mm. Like that. Yeah, they're not a cardboard cutout. They're not a, a mannequin. They're actually real living people, you know, because we're all flawed. We're all, we've all got our, our character quirks and it just makes for far more interesting characters. Carrying on from your discussion of characters, I've got a combo of questions for you. Do you ever base any characters on people that you know? And also, how do you deal with hitting a block in your like, plot or character development? What are your strategies for overcoming it? I've never yet based any any of my characters on real people. I've taken real people's names because I've put you in one of my books, haven't I, Caroline? And yeah. Yeah. Writing at the moment has your dad in it. David Gilchrist is making an appearance. Um, <laughs> but I haven't used real characters and real personalities. And I know it's a joke with authors like, you know, oh, if you annoy me, I'll put you in my novel. But I would never do that. I, find, I think that's very passive aggressive behavior and I wouldn't do it. So all my characters are straight out of my head. Their names might not be, but their characters are. Yeah, I, I, my, my main character in my first series, Chopra, he's, he's basically me because um, I lived in India for a decade. And there was a lot of things about India that I didn't like. I loved it, obviously, being there, uh, which is why I stayed 10 years. But the poverty that I saw and the level of inequality and, all, and most, mostly the, the, the lack of equality and justice. Because if you've got money or some influence in India, you can literally get away with anything up to and including murder. And there's some famous cases of movie stars who've got away with manslaughter and running people. A very famous movie star ran over a bunch of homeless people on the pavement and, you know, 15, 20 years later, he's still not spent more than a day behind behind bars. And that kind of thing never sits that well with me. And a lot of that's been distilled into the character of, of Chopra because the Indian police force on the whole has a terrible reputation for being corrupt, incompetent and abusive. So I drew him as a character who is... The opposite to that, he's an honest man in this sea of corruption, trying to do the right thing for whichever crime comes onto his uh, onto his desk, and then later onto his detective agency, whether it's a rich person or a poor person, he tries to evaluate it through that uh, prism of of justice. So, I, I never use real people. Uh, I would feel really bad doing that as well. Um, sometimes I use when I'm starting out thinking about characters, the characters in a new book, in a, in a kind of whodunit, if there's five or six suspects, I'll have them physically based on someone, maybe a little bit, to begin with. Like, my new book I'm starting this month, probably the day after tomorrow, 
the, there's one character in there who is based off physically his appearance, a guy who helped me cut down a tree once. <laughs> and I, I cut down all my own trees uh, with axes and with chainsaws, but I'm not skilled. I'm, I'm like it could go. There's a there's a range of places the tree could go, the range of directions. I'm okay, but I'm not like a proper Swede or Canadian lumberjack. So if there's a tree that's close to a building, I'll get this guy to come over and help me out, and he can just place the tree wherever he wants. It's a beautiful thing. It's a real skill. It's an art. And uh, so a character's based off him, but as soon as I start writing that character, he'll have a different voice to this guy, a different name, a different personality, but it helps me start have a starting point for that minor character. And then the second part of that, how do you deal with any blocks that you hit in like plot or character development? I've not yet hit any blocks when it comes to characters. I think because they all come out of my head, if I need to change them, if a plot requires a change, then it's really easy to do. What I've definitely run into are, are you know, problems with the plot. You know, I, I sense it's heading down a dead end and I need to, um, you know, retrieve it somehow. Um, I think for me, the, the way that it works is a bit time consuming, but I have to take a step back. I have to put the book aside for a while and I usually find if I don't think too hard about it, the solution will come to me. But if I really try and press myself to find the right solution and get all agitated about it, you know, it just doesn't, my creative brain sort of freezes. So my solution is to put the book aside just for a few days, maybe a week. And I usually find that some quiet time, the answer will come to me and I'll get some great ideas as to how to revamp the plot. Well, um, they say Agatha Christie used to uh, write in a bathtub, a full bathtub, um, <laughs> while eating apples, apparently, in, in hotels. It, this was something that she used to do, so uh, it seemed to work for her. So I tend to have a quick jog around the block, um, brisk cold shower, tends to get, uh, get the brain moving. Again, if I ever get stuck, I don't tend to get stuck a lot. I tend to have a very detailed plot which might take a few months before i even start writing so all of that blockage blockage has already happened during the development phase and mm. i think i really cannot understand people who say they write just like that i mean i don't know if any of you guys are like that but i, no, I, think, you no, say you're not, but that. I think there's got to be a plot. maybe will is he's smoking there maybe he's a <laughs> panther not really I don't, I don't, I'm not one of these people who have like a massive spreadsheet where they know everything that's going to happen. Yeah, it's me. Okay. Me. <laughs> kind of like me. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet. I wish I could do that. I, I, I can. I'm ashamed of it. <laughs> I visualize the whole story before I start writing it so I can see it, but I can't, I don't write much down. So I can, I know where the plot's going in terms of like the, the main arc. I know what happens roughly at the beginning, middle and the end, but I don't know all the little bits and pieces. So I do get into trouble uh, with the plot as I go along, just like in small ways. As I say, I know where it's going, but I might need to figure out how Tuva investigates a particular piece in the puzzle. And I find the best thing for me is driving. If I drive my yeah. truck to the next forest to pick up my kid from his forest school and drive back again, by the time I've picked him up and got home, I probably haven't even noticed any traffic lights, but at least I've fixed the plot problem. Great. Uh, there's a nice compliment here from Leslie Thompson for all of you. She says, she will look like you're having jolly good hair days if you've got personal <laughs> hairdressers. <laughs> I was just no. thinking the opposite. I mean, we're all in lockdown. I mean, I haven't been to a hairdresser for quite a long time. So thanks for saying that, Leslie. It made me feel a lot better. <laughs> Very nice. Well, Will is famous for having the, the best hair in crime fiction. So, uh, uh, both on his head and and his beard. Uh, yeah, that is me. This is only after this is only after gelling it all all down because li I was literally looking like a wild man earlier on because uh, it's been I think five weeks without a without a haircut. It's uh, yeah, uh, without this amount of gel and stuff in their hair, it wouldn't look this this smart. <laughs> I definitely do not have the best hair. Denise Minor has the best hair. Denise Minor does have good hair. Okay, uh, I've got another question for you. It says, are there any authors you eagerly await each release from? Um, Peter James and Stephen King, I think. And also um, one of the authors in the Crime Book Club, Tony Forder. So I think those three, they get my votes. Um, well, I love literary fiction as well. And I do like um, 
I love John Irving, who I mentioned earlier, so I, I look forward to that. But um, now I know this is going to probably get booze or, from quite a lot of people, but I do like a good Dan Brown. You know? <laughs> and I know that people sometimes say things uh, that his writing is not, you know, super stellar, but it, I enjoy that whole the the arcana that he throws into his books and then we go on a journey of learning a little bit about history and various bits and pieces. Uh, Michael Connolly is another favorite of mine. He writes the Harry Bosch series. I've got every single one of those. So I love those. And it was a wonderful experience meeting him a couple of years ago. Plug for my my friend. Um, where's he gone? <laughs> Abir Mukherjee for people who like India set fiction. I love his uh, India set book set in the days of the Raj, uh, Sam Wyndham series. So there's quite a few series I look forward to. One last one I'll mention, um, other than Wills, obviously, which I always look, for, look forward to, and Mike Cravens, who I, I read regularly as well. Uh, but this, uh, I've never met this author, Jane Harper, but she won the Gold Dagger, I think, a few years ago with this book, The Dry. I mean, this is a brilliant crime novel. It really is. And her writing since, the, the, the two books since then have also been really good. So th those are some good plugs for good crime fiction. I would echo a load of those. I love uh, Jane Harper's books. I agree. I think every single one of her books has been incredible. She's, her, she, her writing is so atmospheric. Mm. It's brilliant. Um, also, Abir's books are fantastic. Love his books. He's getting better and better as a writer. He's just amazing. Superb. Um, I love uh, Cormac McCarthy. He's my favorite writer. So no country yeah. for <laughs> the ultimate yeah. crime. I yeah. absolutely love that novel. And we were talking before about um they will yeah there it is my favorite book <laughs> not a good book i'm a huge fan right <laughs> i'm a huge fan of this book but also but the i like no country for old men better than this but this is a brilliant book as well so both amazing yeah i love them he's he's so talented and i, I like people like sarah waters as well who writes some good gothic uh she, fingersmith the lady yeah. who wrote is she the one who wrote fingers have you seen yeah. the korean Sorry to take this off track for a second, but this is a recommendation for anyone. If, you, if you've read Fingersmith or you like that kind of convoluted, big twist uh, novel, it was turned into a movie, a Korean movie called The Handmaiden. And it is a, it is a brilliant movie. Do not read the plot online anywhere. Just watch the movie because there's you know, twists and stuff that go on and you don't want to have any spoilers. Fantastic. I should just finish off by saying I'm also a big fan of Ellie Griffith. She's someone who I look, look forward to yeah. her next book. And, and she's just won um, uh, an Edgar, Edgar Award. Yeah. Very well deserved. Um, and, and a bunch of other writers as well. Gillian Flynn, you know, if she wrote another novel ever, I would be there pre-ordering it for sure. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, and a question we had quite a while ago was, who did you dedicate your first book to? I should know this and I cannot remember. I think I dedicated it to all my beta readers, but I'm not sure about that. But yeah, I always like to thank everyone who's helped me in a book. And I, I'm pretty sure it's people who helped get it get um, his kidnapper produced to publication. I think it was to my, well, I know it was to my, my parents, but especially my mother, because when I was 17 and I wanted to be a writer and not go to university, they being Indian parents, Asian parents, basically said no chance of that happening. You know, you're going to go to university and you're going to be an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer. I d ended up studying accounts and I, you know, I've had a really good career as a management consultant, not as an accountant. Uh, but uh, my mother uh, passed from cancer just a, a year or so, a year before my first book came out. So she never got to see me actually publish. So, you know, that was the de main dedication, I think. Um, and Dark Pines was dedicated to my wife, Mrs. D, who has to put up with a lot because, you know, she's also a city person and I dragged her out into the wilderness to live with no running water. <laughs> no, like when we moved here, we had no toilet. We had a compost toilet in a shack, 100 we have to use logs for cooking and heating and that kind of thing so she's uh, she's been very understanding and my first draft I write in a month and I'm basically a zombie for the whole month complete and utter zombie so I owe her a lot so the book was dedicated to her 
I'm really still amazed. Happy. Every time you tell me that story, I'm amazed that one, she's put up with you, but, <laughs> but also that you anyone can write uh, as well as you write and do it all within a month. It's just amazing. Especially without a plan as well, because from what you say, Will, you know, you, you, you're not a plotter like me. You don't write it all down. It's just in your head. So, yeah, hats off to you. But it's not a very healthy thing. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. It's uh, I, by the end of it, I'm completely exhausted, mm -hmm. and I literally stay in Tuva's head for a month. Um, when I'm not right, I write a chapter in the morning, a chapter in the afternoon, and then the whole of the rest of the day, thinking about that scene, the next scene that's coming. So it's it's not a good process. It's not healthy at all, and it may, it means that I have to do so many, like triple as many rewrites as you guys did. But in the end, it still takes me a year, full time. So it's not quick in the end, it's just quick at the beginning. Yeah. Well, I think we all operate differently, you know. I mean, if you're a plotter, I think it's really hard to understand someone who's a pantser and vice versa, but you've just got to work with, you know, the way your brain works, really. The world's most famous pantser is apparently Stephen King. Who, who I can't believe that. Well, I can because I love, I love his work and I've been reading it since I was a kid. But if you look at his books, he was once accused of having in, in the press, he was accused of having verbal diarrhea. And you can understand why, <laughs> yeah. because yeah. I mean, the, the stand was originally 1400 pages and then they cut it down to about 700 pages. And he had a hissy fit because he thought the other 700 were necessary. So 20 years later, he published a special edition with the full 1400 <laughs> pages. And, you know, there's one scene, I think, where he spends 30 pages describing a room. You don't need it, Stephen King. He can be a bit wordy. I mean, I love the guy. I think he's amazing. I would read his shopping list if he published it. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, Great imagination. Wonderful imagination. Yeah, amazing guy. I'd love to meet him. But I'd be such a fan girl. I'd probably just faint at his feet. You know, I'd be so overcome. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, read, I read on writing every year. I think it's such a brilliant book yeah. about writing. Yeah. This book. And all of, all of his books, I, I, you know, I think he's... He's the guy I read more than anybody else as a teenager, and he's another author. I would pick up his new book straight away. Yeah. Uh, that you can, I can tell, I think, he's a pantser because of his endings a little sometimes. They can be a little bit weak at times, yeah. Or just all over the place. I still love them, but they're a bit wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, essentially, he can just make anything up, right? Because it's, other than her, I think he did a, a, few, a couple of crime novels uh, two or three years ago, but other than that, his books are fantasy and horror and you can pretty much make stuff up as you go along. You don't, you don't have to follow the formula that crime, most crime novels have to follow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we're coming up to the end of our time now. Do you want to just update all the people who are watching on what you're currently working on or any current releases you have out? Um, yeah, I'm currently working on my eighth novel, which is provisionally called Seeds of Separation. Um, it's the one who's going to feature your dad, um, David, David Gilchrist. Um, I won't say too much about the plot at the moment because I'm in the middle of a major plot revamp. It's one of those situations where the plot wasn't working, so I've had to go back to basics and we rework it. And I'm still not sure I've got it right, but it's basically going to cover um, adoption and abandonment theory and all that sort of thing. So some very, very wounded and psychologically damaged characters in it. Um, well, I'd, I'll say that I've got this paperback out, which has just come out, and uh, it's not a great time to launch your, launch your fifth paperback because, um, as we all know, bookshops are closed. 700 odd ind independent bookshops are all but closed. You, you know, the only thing they can do is mail order, and you know, books are not people's priority, I guess, at the moment. Um, so it's a difficult time. So I'd, uh, you know, anyone who's interested in being taken to India and to Bombay and, and find out what uh, India is like and wrap it all up in a nice mystery. Be my guest. And I'm, I'm to you, my, my third book, uh, Black River, came out like three weeks ago, four, five weeks ago, something like that. I've lost track of time completely, uh, but it came out in March, came out in March, and it's set over midsummer. So it's a missing persons investigation with Tuva Moody Son. Uh, set in this very creepy junkyard next to a river, a riverside junkyard with a lot of eccentric characters. And the the, the big mystery is that Tuva's best friend, Tammy, has gone missing. So she has to get out there and search the forests and get into these weird little shack villages to try and find it. But right now I'm writing, so I'm doing edits for Tuva 4. Can't reveal the title yet, not allowed to. And then Tuva 5, I start yeah, the day after tomorrow. 
Great, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming and joining in on our panel. It's been fascinating. And thank you, Caroline, for, for hosting. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. You.